Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now get your notepads, your writing instruments. Matthew chapter 24. Let's take a look here at verse number 1. Matthew 24 and verse number 1. Now we know from verse 1 through verse 3, the question was asked of Christ, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's Matthew 24, verse 1 through verse 3. And verse number 4, Jesus says, Take heed that no man does what? Deceive you. Now let's take a look here at verse number 14. Verse number 14 says, And this gospel, shall we read that together? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And in the context of the gospel being proclaimed, received and proclaimed, and to usher in the second coming of Christ, the end will come. Listen what book Christ says we are to study. Verse number 15, together. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him do what? Let him understand. This evening we're going to study a specific chapter in the book of Daniel. Now we know that this week, since October 22nd, 2018. We're now October 27th, 2018. The memorial of Christ moving from the holy place to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of investigative judgment. So we want to spend some time looking at a specific chapter, studying it in the book of Daniel. In the book, Early Writings, page 6 to 3, we are told that it's not precious truth the flock need, but what do we all need? It is present truth. And the second paragraph says, but such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to do what? Explain the past Advent movement and to show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting, and give certainty to the glorious future. These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messenger should do what? Should dwell. What are those subjects? The sanctuary. In what? In connection with what? The 2300 days. Of course, 10 commandments, faith of Jesus. Now what came to an end or what began at the end of the 2300 prophetic days? The investigative judgment. Now look with me in your Bibles. Daniel chapter 8. Where are we going to? The 8th chapter of Daniel in the book Selected Messages. Book 2, page 308 to 9. We need to understand that the subjects that were highlighted in the book Early Writings and page 6 to 3, those are the subjects that make us Seventh-day Adventists. And if we reject those subjects, we are not Seventh-day Adventists. Regardless if our names are chronicled on a church record, we are not Seventh-day Adventists. Christians, we are not God's people. We are no different than those in Babylon. May I add, we are worse because we have privileges and opportunities that they don't have. All right, look here. Selected messages, book two, page 308 to nine, it says, after the what, friends? Come on. From top, it says, after the passing of the time. Now, pause right there. The second paragraph from Gospel Workers, page 265, paragraph one, is simply giving us the date for the phrase. This phrase, is used over, this phrase is used a myriad of times in the spirit of prophecy. And what's that phrase? The passing of the time. That points to 1844, specifically the disappointment, October 22nd. Get back to the, to the top paragraph. It says, now after the passing of the time, 
God entrusted to his faithful followers the precious principles of present, present truth. All right. These principles were not given to those who had had no part in the giving of the first and second angel's messages. All right. They were given to the workers who had had a part in the cause from the beginning. what beginning? Leading up to October 22nd, 1844. All right. Watch this now. Next paragraph. It says, those who passed through these experiences are to be as firm as a rock to the principles that have made us what? So what subjects make us Seventh-day Adventists? Just go back, present truth, my friends. And what subjects comprise present truth? Let's go backward. What is it, my friends? In early writings, the sanctuary. What else? The 2300 days. Christ work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. What else? The Ten Commandments and the faith of Jesus. Amen? So these principles make us what? So if we reject these principles and say there's no such thing as Christ being in the most holy place since October 22nd, 1844, are we Seventh-day Adventists? Notice, those who passed through these experiences, now, and she tells us what they were in giving the first, on the first paragraph on top, the first and the second angel's messages. And what says that first angel? Fear God and give. Why? The hour of his judgment is come. All right. Those who pass through these experiences are to be as firm as a rock to the principles that have made us Seventh-day Adventists. They are to be workers together with God, binding up the testimony and sealing the law among his disciples. All right. They can speak from personal experience regarding the truths entrusted to them. These men, now watch this carefully, these men are not to permit their faith, those doctrines, to be changed to infidelity. Don't let infidels come into our Sabbath school lesson guides, in our pulpits, what do you say? Amen. These men are not to permit their faith to be changed to infidelity. They are not to permit the banner of which angel now? Third angel. To be taken from their hands. Preach it. Do not dilute it or evade it. They are to hold the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end. The Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. Every truth that God has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to where? Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. Let's read now. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization. For this would mean apostasy from the truth. So how do we know the new organization? They have a new name? Not necessarily. How do we know the new organization? Because you're not linked to the conference? How do we know them? How do we know the new organization? They have rejected the messages in the first, the second, and third angel's messages. They don't believe in the sanctuary anymore. They don't believe that the papacy is the primary antichrist. They don't believe that. They don't believe the papacy is the little horn of Daniel 8. They don't believe that. It's a new organization. But it does not mean that they no longer attend a Seventh-day Adventist local church. Doesn't mean that. Don't be deceived, friends. And many of them point to those who are presenting, living, present truth, that they have begun a new organization. 
because they're not connected to a NAD division or the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Do not be deceived. Come back here. All right. What happened between 1950 and 1955? We published the book, this church... Part, hold one second. All right, and what is this book called? Seventh-day Adventist answer what? Questions on doctrine. And why did we publish that book? Who did we try to become in harmony with? The men from Babylon, evangelicals. And in that book, we rejected present truth. Specifically, October 22nd, 1844 and of course we carefully said that that little horn of chapter 8 of Daniel is not the papacy it's somebody else then we come to Desmond Ford what is what what is he now teaching and has been teaching that October 22nd 1844 it is hogwash that's what he said Andrews University no longer teaches that now let's come to a more current event here we have Adventists today headline letting Roman Catholics off the hook stating that chapter 13 of Revelation verse 1 through verse 10 does not point to the papacy these men have begun a new organization they have left the platform they have a, a apostatized from the truth notice here come to this now I want to get to this this came out around this week this week October 22nd 2018 this is from spectrum magazine now let me say it this way spectrum magazine is a new organization they have left the foundation and yet they carry a large influence among seventh-day Adventists and I have observed that normally around this time of the year, annually, they make sure to publish some article that is destroying the truth of Seventh-day Adventists. Headline says, 1844 and the future of Adventism. Watch carefully. This is uh, an author by the name of Andres Reis. Oh, Andres Reis. All right. He writes in the article, a response to Clifford Goldstein on the little horn of chapter 8 of Daniel. I explore how the Adventist interpretation of the little horn as a Roman power fails the basic test of biblical hermeneutics interpretation. Previously, I had been more tentative about seeing Antiochus IV Epiphanes as the little horn in Daniel 8. In other words, the little horn is no longer the papacy, it is the Greek king. It goes on, I now believe that the textual evidence points to this Seleucid king as the fulfillment of Daniel 8. In some, the traditional understanding of papal Rome, the papacy, Roman Catholicism, in the eighth chapter of Daniel is untenable. He says, the chapter clearly focuses on how the Jews suffered under who? Greece. Greece. And its descendants for a short period of time after which the temple was restored and reconsecrated. Watch this now. Scholars unanimously interpret the desecrations of Antiochus IV Epiphanes in the second century BC as fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel 8. Who cares if scholars unanimously say the little horn is not the papacy, it's some other king. Who cares? The majority of the world say the Lord's day is Sunday. Are they correct? Next paragraph, despite the compelling text, now he's saying this now, despite the compelling 
textual and historical evidence for a Greek little horn, Adventists are virtually isolated in seeing Rome in Daniel 8. So what? We're either right or wrong, and based on Scripture, we are accurate. He continues, why is this so important for us? Now, he had the audacity to be calling or, or, or making himself a Seventh-day Adventist with the pronoun us. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. All right? He says, because accepting that Daniel 8 predicts a second century BC Greek little horn instead of the papacy essentially destroys Adventism's prophetic rise at the end of the 2300 year period in now what is he saying here now so what is the connection between the little horn and October 22nd 1844 is there a connection and what is it So if you understand who that little horn is, you have a better understanding to interpret October 22nd, 1844 from the 2300 day prophecy. But if you have a false interpretation of the little horn, then you cannot substantiate 1844, October 22nd. They stand together or they all together. All right, get back here. Next paragraph. He says, isn't it ironic that we, Adventists, have put so much emphasis on the papacy in Daniel 8 that we have turned it into the very reason for our existence? Who had the boldness to put this in print? And then turn around and cause himself a what? <laughs> My friends, if you, if you negate and reject this truth of the little horn and the day of atonement, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are not a part of God's, God's remnant movement. You are essentially, factually, <laughs> substantially Babylon. It says... The thing we detest is what gives us existential meaning. Without the papacy, in chapter 8 of Daniel, there would be no Adventism. Wait a minute. Let's go again. He says, without the papacy, that means if you, if you believe the papacy, is the little horn of chapter 8 of Daniel, then you can prove the Adventist church. But if you reject that little horn and say it's not the papacy, then guess what? There is no Adventist church. How, how could he call himself Adventist? These men are discombobulated, my friend. Babylon, confused. He says, as a fragile, and they will tell you, I have my master's degree. I have my doctorate degree. What do we call that, um, PhD? Permanent head damage. <laughs> what, Christopher? What now? Please hire desperate. Mm. As a fragile house of... No, you get the point, right, friends? Let's go here. Daniel, go there with me. Daniel. And then he attacks Sister White. Listen now. As a fragile house of cards, susceptible to the softest breeze, the Adventist belief system built on the shaky ground of 1844, the infallibility of Ellen White and... Uh, marred by perfectionistic tendencies is just too fragile to stand serious questioning. 
That's, that's compact. In other words, he's saying that Sister White, her, her, her writings cannot be trusted either. And that we can never be perfect. Do you see this, my friends? Serious. And yet, what is the work of Christ in the most holy place right now? To blot out sin. And what is sin? Of law. So that means if he's going to save us, we must get victory over sin. And what does Christ call that experience in Matthew 5 verse 48? Be you also perfect. Let's go here. Perfection. Come here. Chapter 8 of Daniel, and we find the little horn. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? Do you know one thing is startling? I want everyone to see this, all right? Are we ready for this, my friends? Notice here, in chapter 8 of Daniel, the little horn is mentioned in verse 9, correct? Put beside little horn the papacy. Come on, walk with me. The papacy, amen? Now, the papacy is in verse 9 as the little horn. Now, these men are calling the little horn, watch carefully, a Greek king. All right? Now, how could that be when verse 5 through verse 7 mentions Greece? Come on. Verse 5. Amen? Ready? Verse 5 mentions which animal in verse 5? He goat. With a notable horn. Okay. Verse 6. Which animal? Ram with two horns. Amen. Come with me to verse 20. Who does the ram represent in verse 20? Medes and Persians. Go back to verse 5. The goat. Come down to verse 21. Who is that rough goat in verse 21? Greece. So the goat is Greece, not the little horn. Do you see it? And notice verse 9 is a little horn. Verse number 5 and verse 21, it's a notable horn. The context means it is a great horn, not a little horn. So now, before you can comprehend the little horn of chapter 8 of Daniel, question for you to bring you in into our study, where is the little horn first mentioned in chapter in the book of Daniel? Where is that first mention? The little horn is first mentioned in Daniel 7. So go there now. Where are we going to, my friends? So let's walk together now. In chapter 7 of Daniel, we find that little horn. And then if you understand who he is from chapter 7, then we can better understand who he is in chapter number 8. Wonderful. Let's go now. Verse 1. Let's study, friends. Come on. Take notes, pencil, pens, books, Bibles. All right. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. All right. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, how many winds? Four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Pause. What, does, what do winds represent in prophecy? Strife, destruction, wars. How do we prove that? Winds. How do we prove that? Okay, it's right there in the verse. The four winds of heaven strove. Now, strove. What is the root word in strove? Strife. So these four winds point to strife, points to war. All right, notice now. It says, strove upon the great sea. What does sea typify in prophecy? What now? Peoples, nations. So how many winds are blowing here? Four upon the great sea. So these are four nations. How many friends? Four nations fighting for world dominance. Does that make sense? Now put beside winds. The winds also represent destruction. Job chapter 1 verse 19. Job what chapter? Job 1 verse 19. Job's children were in the house and the winds hit the four corners of the house and the house... And the house fell, destroyed Job's children. 
come down to verse 3. Let's find these four nations now striving for world dominion. Verse 3. And four great beasts which came up from the sea, diverse one from another. What does a beast typify in prophecy? A beast points to a nation, a kingdom. What, what verse say that? Go to verse 17 quickly. Chapter 7, verse 17. It says, these great beasts, there it is, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Now, and kings reign over what? Kingdom. Kingdom. So these four beasts are four kingdoms. And they are striving for what world? All right. World dominance. Come down to verse 4. Let's see now the first beast, the first kingdom, the first nation. Verse 4. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the, stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Pause now. So who would this lion kingdom represent? The lion is Babylon. Now what scriptures say the lion is Babylon? Come on. Jeremiah, put it down. Jeremiah, chapter 50. Chapter 50 of Jeremiah, verse 43 through verse 45. I won't go there. Just note it. All right? Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 43 through verse 45. I'll give you a second scripture. Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. What verse is? I heard of it. Verse 6 through verse 8. So that means you have marked your Bible. Amen. All right? Put it there. Amen? So this is Babylon. Okay? Skip on down to verse 5. Verse 5 now, and it's interesting. If you look at the language in verse 4, you see Nebuchadnezzar. If you look at the language in verse 4, you will see Nebuchadnezzar. Because he also was made into an animal. And then a man's heart was given back to him now. When he came to his senses, and then he praised God. Nebuchadnezzar is right there. Amen. The context tells you it's Nebuchadnezzar. Come back here now. Verse 5. And behold, another beast. And what's a beast in prophecy? Kingdom. A second like to a what? Bear. All right. It raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, and what now? Devour much flesh. So this second beast, the bear, conquers the beast before it, which was the lion. Watch carefully now. And the lion is Babylon. Now you know it's prophecy, my friends. Because naturally, a bear would not destroy a lion. But when God says something, it doesn't matter how mighty that nation looks. If God says that nation will be destroyed by a more inferior nation, it's going to come to pass. Naturally, a bear would not destroy a lion. <laughs> All right. So which nation destroyed the lion? Babylon. Medes and Persians. That means the bear kingdom is the Medes and Persians. Persia today, which, which, country, which country today carries the name Persia? Iran, all right? Verse 5, this beer points to Iran. Medes and Persians. Now, which scripture says, follow me, that the Medes and Persians conquered Babylon? Daniel chapter 5, amen? Come on, chapter 5 of Daniel and verse number 20, verse 24 through verse 31, verse 24 through verse 31. Again, Persia, Medes and Persians, conquered Babylon. Come down to verse 7. Verse, no, pause right there. Verse 5 now says that it had three ribs. How many ribs? So this kingdom, Medes and Persia, it's interesting. It raised itself up on one side. That means this kingdom is a twofold kingdom. Medes, Darius, 
Persians, Cyrus. Come to verse number five. And it had how many ribs? Three ribs in the mouth of it. Three ribs? Devour much flesh. What does a rib, pardon me, okay, what would a rib represent in scripture? Don't tell me chicken. What would a rib point to in scripture? Rib. A person. A person. Where's the first place you find the word rib in the Bible? Adam and Eve, God formed man, right? And then to make Eve, what did God do? Genesis, come on, put it down. Genesis chapter 2, amen? And verse 22, ver verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and from that rib, he formed a person. So a rib points to a person or a king or a nation. Does that make sense? And what were those three kingdoms, the Medes and Persians, conquered in order to become a world superpower? Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Babylon, Lydia, that's all history. Babylon, Lydia, Egypt. Let's go to verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another beast, like unto a what? Leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads. And what now? Dominion was given to it. World dominance now. So which nation conquered the Medes and Persians? It's Greece. That's history, my friends. Greece. Now, which scripture says that Greece conquered the Medes and Persians? Which scripture? Daniel chapter 8. Go there. Chapter 8 of Daniel, verse 5 through verse 7. Verse 5 through verse 7. Verse 20 and 21. Those five verses. Verse 5 through verse 7. Verse 20, verse 21, they tell us Greece would conquer the Medes and Persians. Here we are. Verse 5. Verse 5, the he goat, one horn. Verse 6, the ram, two horns. Verse 7, and I saw him, the goat, come close unto the ram. And the goat was moved with anger against him and smote the ram. So who smote who? The goat smote the ram, broke his two horns. Who is the goat? Come to verse 21. Who is the goat? Verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia or Greece. Who is the ram with two horns? Verse 20. Medes and Persians. So who conquered who? The Gr Greece conquered Medes and Persians. And who was that king of Greece? Alexander the Great. Amen. All right, come down. Verse 7. So now, the fourth beast. Now, verse 7 now says, After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth kingdom. Dreadful. Now, notice, this one is not called a lion, nor a bear. Amen. Nor a leopard, nor a tiger. Amen. A hyena. Uh-uh. What is this one called? Elephant? No. What is it? It's called, it has a name. It's a dreadful and terrible beast, strong, exceedingly. And it had what? Great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. So who is this fourth beast? Based on history, which nation conquered Greece and became the world's superpower? Roman Empire. Roman Empire. Now, can you give scriptures that show that Rome conquered Greece? Anybody? Come on. It's Daniel chapter 11 that shows that, my friends. What did I say? Now, do you remember in the days of Christ? Which nation was ruling during Christ's first advent? Which nation? Which one? It's Rome. Pagan Rome. All right. Now, when Pilate 
wrote King of the Jews, what language did he write in? Latin, Hebrew, Greek. That's it. Latin, Hebrew, Greek. Why those three languages? Who spoke Latin? Latin, Latin, Romans, Hebrew, Orthodox, Greek, the Grecians, or Koine Greek. All right, notice now. But which nation ruled over all, 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 all two or all three? Rome. How do we know Rome ruled the world then? Taxes. Come on, taxes. Who taxed the world? Rome. Hold your place. Caesar, hold your place. Go to Luke 2. Where are we going to, my friends? Taxes. Go to Luke 2. If you are taxing the world, who is in charge? You are. Rome. Luke 2. Go to verse 1. It says, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. What country is that? Rome. That all, how many? All the world should be what? Tax. Who is in charge now, friends? Rome. And again, now, possibly in the next two Sabbaths, we will go through chapter 11 of Daniel. Come back to verse 7 of chapter 7 of Daniel. Come back there. Chapter 7 of Daniel, look with me. At verse number 7, Roman Empire, dreadful and terrible. How many horns did this nation have? Ten horns. That means Rome was divided into how many kingdoms? Ten. Roman Empire. Ten kingdoms. That's history, my friends. Oh, take a look at verse 8 now. Here is your little horn. So now, where must we find the little horn geographically located? <laughs> Among those ten nations that comprised the ancient Roman Empire. Go to verse 8 now. So verse 7 ends by saying Rome was divided into 10. Look at verse 8. I considered the horns or the 10 nations, divisions. And behold, there came up where? Underscore that. Among them. Another. It couldn't be Greece. It could not. Because Greece is a leopard. It's off the sea now. Amen. Could not be Greece. Little horn. Come on, let's read. And I saw there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, watch this, were eyes like the eyes of man and a what now? And a mouth speaking. What, friends? Great things. Don't forget that. Little horn, eyes of a man. And what is he doing? Let's identify who this is. Now, what is a horn in prophecy? A horn is a kingdom, a king. What scripture says that? Very important. What now? Verse 24. Go there. Go to verse 24. A horn typifies a kingdom. Chapter 7 of Daniel and verse 24. We want some arrows in our quiver. Look at verse number 24. Are we there? It says, and he said unto me, the fourth, no, verse 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are what? Ten kings. Ten kings. And kings reign over what? Kingdoms. So one horn is what? A kingdom. I'll give you a second scripture. Hold your place in Daniel. Go to Revelation 17. Where are we going to? Chapter 17 of Revelation. And look with me at verse number 12. It says, verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. What's a horn again? A king, a kingdom. Pause right there. So what? What adjective is used for the horn? The king. Come back. Chapter 7, Daniel, verse 8. What is that adjective for the horn? He is a little horn. That means this, this country, it must be little. And it must remain little until Christ comes. 
or else you wouldn't be able to identify it. So which country is the smallest country, has always been the smallest country, and is the smallest country, and will continue to be the smallest country until Jesus comes. Nobody can miss it. Get to the screen. It says this is the history channel. What is the smallest, or may I add, what is the littlest? No such word. What is the smallest country in the world? Answer. Answer red words. Vatican City is the one. It's the smallest country in the world, my friends. Always has been, still is, and will continue to be the smallest horn. Nobody can miss it. BBC News. BBC News. Vatican. Country. Profile. Headline. Skip on down. What am I? The second paragraph right here is right here. It's ter second paragraph, its territory is surrounded by the what? The Italian capital city called what? Rome. Watch this now. First paragraph, the Vatican is the smallest independent state in the world, my friends, and residence of the spiritual leadership of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the little horn. You can't miss that, my friends. Put down this key scripture. John chapter 14, verse 29. John chapter 14, verse 29. Jesus says, I tell you these things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you might believe. It's a heavy, a profound scripture. Again, I tell you these things before they come to pass. What does that mean, before they come to pass? Prophecy. That when they come to pass, how would you know when it has come to pass? History or current, amen? That when you see it come to pass, current event or history, you might believe. All right, come back here now. Chapter 7 of Daniel, look at verse 8 again. It says, this horn, little horn, is the papacy. Now, where is the Vatican situated? Which country was the Vatican a part of first before it got its own land? Italy, Italy my friends. Was Italy one of the ten kingdoms of the ancient Roman Empire? That's it, friends. Come here, come here. Go to verse 8 now, and look what happens in verse 9. Don't forget, in verse 8, he speaks what things? Underscore. Because we want to know what he's talking about, what he's saying, Amen. Come to verse 9. Look what follows next. Verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. My friends, everybody's antenna must go up now. This is the connection between the little horn and October 22nd, 1844. All right? How long did the little horn reign for, the papacy? 1260 years. From what year? 538 AD through 1798. So now talk to me. That means verse 8, verse 8, the papacy, little horn, would cover what years? 538 AD through 1798. Look what happens in verse 9 now. I beheld. Till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Let's read now. And the... Uh, Judgment was, and the books were. That's the connection. So if you call the little horn the Greek king, that's the second BC. So when will the, the judgment begin? In BC? No. It destroys the prophecy. The little horn is the papacy 538 through 
1798. Then verse 9 through verse 10 brings us 46 years later to what year? 1844. That's, it, my That's the connection. They stand together or they fall together. All right, look at this now. Verse 11. Does everyone know the date in verse number 10? It is October 22nd. What year? I'm going to give you your homework right now. Since this is such an important, significant point next week's Sabbath, I want every one of you between now and next Sabbath to study the f how many ways I gave you? Six or five? The five, the, the five ways to prove October 22nd, 1844. So next Sabbath, I'm going to nominate, I'm going to call on you, I'm going to point you out, and you will stand up, and you will give us one of those five ways of how to prove from Scripture and from history October 22nd, 1844. And those five ways you received, if you realize you did not get any spirit of prophecy. It was simply Bible and history. Five ways. Now, you can go online to the website and get the notes, study it. But when you come next week, you will not be able to get the sermon notes and read it like this. No, no, no. It's your Bible and you will talk to us. And each person who comes, you have only 15 minutes, 15 minutes to share. That means I, only, I will only call on five persons next week, Sabbath, only five. And each person will give one way to prove October 22nd, 1844, using Bible and history. No spread of prophecy. You have your notes. You have your notes. All right? Amen? It's our foundation. It's our foundation. And I'm going to have a mixture of youth and adults. And you don't know who I'm going to point on. So come prepared. And by the way, so as no one is left out, I want each person to write down. Now you can look at the five, the five ways, but choose the one you prefer and put down your own notes and deliver that to us. We will look over it and give you feedback. Now, don't think we are naive that you would take the same notes, copy, paste, and no, that's not going to work. Not, not, put it in your own words. Amen? When is that due? Let's go back here now. Daniel chapter 7. All right. Look at verse 11 now. Verse 11 says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words, which the horn speak. He's always talking. He loves to chat. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to what? Wait a minute now. So how long would the little horn reign for? So verse 11 is telling us, even though the papacy reigned from 538 through 1798, she is going to rise again and be dominant again until the burning flame. Burning flame. What comes to your mind? This is hell's fire. Does that make sense? So put beside verse number 11, hell's fire and second advent. Hell's fire and second advent. Come with me now. Verse 12. Ready, ver ready my friends? Verse 12. Verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, who, who would those be? Who would the rest be? Babylon. So underscore rest of the beasts. That's Babylon. Who else? Come on. Medes and Persians. Who else? Greece. And who else? Rome. So now, those four now, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, verse 12, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged 
for a season and time. What does that mean? It simply means that even though Babylon lost her dominion, her characteristics were passed on to the nation that conquered her. Persia. Make sense now? And then when Greece conquered Persia, some of her traits were brought over into Greece. When Rome came on the scene, the traits of Babylon, Persia, and Greece were found in Rome, pagan Rome. And when the papacy came on the scene, when the papacy came on the scene, she now has the characteristic traits of Babylon, Medes and Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. What scripture says that? Let's go there. So put beside verse 12, Revelation 13, verse 1 and verse 2. Go there with me now. Revelation 13. Verse 1, verse 2, it says this, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. How do we know this beast is a papacy? What phrase, what word in verse 1 from the very beginning tells us this is the papacy? What is that word? Blasphemy. Talk to me now. What does blasphemy mean in scripture? A man who claims to be God. What text say that? John chapter 10 verse 30 through verse 33. The Bible says a man who claims to be God. That's blasphemy. Which church has a man or which nation has a man who claims to be God? The papacy. The Vatican, the so-called Holy See. What else does blasphemy mean? A man who claims to be able to forgive sins. What scripture say that? Mark chapter 2, verse 5 through verse 7. Now many of us say we know that already. My friends, if we're sleeping and we are awakened and we stand before kings and queens and rulers, churchmen in the court of law, and we are challenged on this point, we should be able to answer and give a reason for what we believe without saying, give me some time to go and refresh my memory. It must be a part of us. So now which church, which nation has men or a man who claim to be able to forgive sins? Mark 2, 5 through verse 7. It is the Vatican. It is the papacy. Come on to verse 2 now. It says, and the beast which I saw, and what's a beast in prophecy? And the beast which I saw was like unto a what now? That's Greece. Do you see it now, friends? And his feet were as the feet of a bear. What's that? The meat and Persians, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Who is that? Babylon. Then it says now, and the dragon gave him his power, seat, and here's my quiz for you. Who would the dragon represent now? Couldn't be Satan in this, in this context here. Come on, dragon. Thank you. Pagan Rome. Why? Because the leopard brings us back to Daniel 7. Amen. The beer brings us back to Daniel 7. The lion brings us back to Daniel 7. So the dragon must also bring us back to Daniel 7. Who is left? The dreadful and terrible beast. Pagan Rome. Does it make sense now, friends? Come back now. Daniel 7. We just covered verse 12. Look at verse 13 now. Verse 13, are we there? Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to whom? The Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him, what three things? My friends, it's so beautiful. Dominion, glory, and the what? When you study God's word, look for some hints. How many times have you read that word dominion? 
Like four times. Just, just quickly, come with me to verse 6. What are the last five words in verse 6? The last six words. And, and dominion was what? That means nations are losing their dominion, right? Watch this now. And there was a second place that word dominion was also, go to verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. So while nations and powers are losing their dominion, what does God offer the church since October 22nd, 1844? Dominion, glory, and a kingdom. What a connection, my friends. What a connection. I wish I could preach a second sermon right now. Just on that. Come with me. Go to verse 15. Verse 15 now says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head did what? Just imagine, some of you are saying, Pastor, I now feel that like Daniel. You're going too fast, Pastor. I'm lost in the woods a long time ago. 50 minutes ago, I was lost. That's how Daniel felt. Hear me? It's like, Lord, have mercy. Lord, what a vision. What a vision. Trouble, perplexed. No, not perplexed. It's like, whoa, overwhelmed is the word. Overwhelmed. But now Daniel said, I may not fully uh, understand lion, Beer, leopard, but I want to focus on that little horn. So you may not comprehend fully the lion, Babylon, the bear, Medes and Persians, the leopard, Greece. Who must you now focus on? You better watch that little horn. Come with me. Go to verse number 16. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things daniel listen to me said the angel these great beasts which are four are four kings daniel which shall arise out of the earth verse 18 but daniel even though they would rise and bring misery and strife don't forget this verse 18 but, mercy. So when you preach prophecy, don't forget the but. Let's read now. But, the what, friends? The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom. How long? Forever, even forever and ever. And then you would think Daniel would be satisfied. No. Verse 19. But angel, then please I want to know the truth, not of the lion, no, not of the beer, no, not of the leopard. And bear in mind, the leopard was the future. Because Daniel lived in the lion kingdom, Babylon. He saw when Darius came and conquered Babylon. He was there. He walked in and said, Mine, Mine. TKL, you far seen. This hand writing on the wall means thus. He was near. But Greece had not yet come. But Daniel did not want to take time to say, tell me about Greece. No. Come on now. Then I, verse 19, then I would know the truth of which beast. Fourth beast. Who is that? Pagan Rome, which was diverse from all the others. Exceeding dreadful whose teeth were of what iron and his nails of brass which devoured break in pieces stamp the residue with his feet and of the ten horns which were in his head and of the other which came up before whom what friends three fell even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake what very great things whose look was more what? Stout than his fellows. That word stout, circle the word stout. That word stout means he's a leader. So who has a, a small nation? And to that small nation, 
other nations look to for guidance. It's the Vatican. The word stout means chief ruler. That's the Pope of Rome, friends. That's where Daniel says, I want to learn the truth about this power right here. The papacy, that little horn. Now, hear me, hear me, hear me. We are living now in 2018. So when Daniel says, tell me about the papacy, do you know what, what we must understand? Two things. We must know two things. In the papacy, what four traits will we find? Babylon, right? Persia, right? Greece, right? And what? Pagan Rome. All four are in the papacy. Who makes an image to the papacy? <laughs> do you see where I'm going with this? So since America makes an image to the papacy, whose characteristic traits are we going to find in apostate Protestant America? Babylon, Medes and Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, and papal Rome, all five in, in America. And what was Babylon known for? Bow down to this image or be thrown in the fiery furnace. Will that be found in America? Did the papacy burn men at the stake? All right. What about the meat and Persians? Laws that cannot be altered. And where was Daniel thrown? In alliance then. What did the papacy do? Does she not make laws and no man, not even a king could change it? Not even the queens of Europe could change the papacy's laws. And if any man dared to defy, where would they be thrown? Not, not fire, in dungeons. And also thrown in amphitheaters where wild beasts would eat the saints alive. The papacy got that from the Medes and Persians. And America forms what? An image to the papacy. So what's coming to America? What about Greece? What was Greece known for? It's education, the spots of Greece, education. And Greece was known for its military. What about the papacy? Does she exalt in education? Jesuit schools, false doctrines, and her Jesuit army. Do you see it, friends? What about Rome? Pagan Rome, what was she known for? <laughs> Idolatry, false worship, and gross immorality. And in pagan Rome, who was Constantine the Great? Talk to me. Who was he, my friends? And what did he do? That's it. The first son of the law in AD 321 AD. Same thing. Amen. So what did the papacy do afterward? So what's coming to America? Does it make sense now, my friends? Come with me. Go to verse 21. It says now, I beheld, and the same horn made what, friends? War with the saints. And what? Prevailed against them. How long did the papacy make war with God's people? 538 to when? 1798. But verse 22 says, She's coming again. Verse 22, until when the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. When will judgment be given to the saints? At the second coming of Christ, for how long? A thousand years. The papacy will be back on the scene. Is she rising, friends? Is she rising? Come with me now. Go to verse 23. So verse 23 
reiterates pagan Rome, the fourth beast. Verse 24, the papacy. Look at verse 25. Verse 25, and he, the papacy, shall speak what? Great, oh, now he's speaking now. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and what? And shall wear out the saints. What does that mean to wear out the saints of God? To persecute God's people. Pause. Who are the saints? What are the identifying marks of the saints? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What text say that? Chapter 14 of the Revelation and verse 12. So the papacy made war against the saints. Why? Because they kept God's commandments. Which one out of all the ten does the papacy hate? The fourth commandment, the Sabbath. Pause. And who makes an image to the papacy? Apostate. Protestant America. So what's coming to America then? So, oh, I just saw it. Let's see. So just as the little horn has a mouth and he speaks, will the image ever speak? Revelation 13, verse 11. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. The papacy, little horn, and he speaks. America, two horns and speaks as a dragon. Verse 15, and command all. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That's America. Making what? An image to the papacy. Come on to verse, verse 25. Make wear out the saints of the most high and what else? And think to change times and laws. Who's, whose times? Whose laws? Did the papacy do that? So what will America do? Because she makes? Are you seeing it, my friends? Come with me. Then it says now, look how, look how Daniel received the end to this vision. Verse 26, but Daniel, but the judgment shall what sit and they shall take away his dominion. Oh, I see it now. I see it now. So when the papacy says, I sit as a queen and shall see no sorrow, she's calling the earth her dominion. But when Jesus comes now and the plagues are falling, her dominion is what now? This earth is what now? Destroyed. And God makes it anew and the saints takes her dominion. I see it now. Do you see it? Amen. And that's how the vision ends, on a good note. Amen. But you have to go through a battle. Hear me now. Some people say, Pastor, oh, watch this. Some folks say, Pastor, <laughs> a Sunday law, watch this carefully, a Sunday law would never take place in America. Hear me, hear me. I'm going to build on what I've given you before. Hear me. A Sunday law would never take place in America under a Republican government. Why? Because they don't believe in climate change. We covered that before. And we know based on God's word, a Sunday law is coming to combat climate change. All right. Watch this. We debunked that theory. This morning, we looked at this current event. Now they want to put the Ten Commandments in public schools and on all state property. Just hear me. I believe this is going to backfire on them because the Holy Spirit is going to speak to some people and they will say, wait a minute. Which day is that seventh day? Some people are going to be awakened. And they'll begin to ask questions. Just as when uh, 
the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the Bible but couldn't comprehend it. And then God sent Philip to interpret the Bible. People are saying, which is that seventh day? It's not Sunday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath, seventh day. Some are going to be awakened. Hear me now. How will the Jews ever keep Sunday? How? Ah, that's where I'm going today. Because people say, hear me, hear me, hear me. When this comes to pass, Ten Commandments in the public square, when the Jews look at the Ten Commandments, what do they comprehend about the fourth? Do they see Sunday or do Jews see the Sabbath? They see Saturday, commonly called. They see Sabbath. When the Sunday churchgoers see the fourth commandment, what do they think? Sunday. Something is going to change in America. Some people say there can be no Sunday law because President Trump's daughter is an Orthodox Jew. And she is daddy's girl. I'm just speaking affectionately. Daddy's girl. And she always has daddy's ears. So a Republican, so many say we have four more, maybe eight more years, no son the law. Because Trump's daughter is what? An Orthodox Jew. Hmm. I'm going somewhere. Have you ever heard Mike Pence and others say, we want in America a Judeo Christian country? That's very deceptive. And when people hear we say, a son the Lord is coming, they say, cannot be. Because Republicans believe that they must uphold a Judeo, Jews, Christian, their values in America. No son the law. Thirdly, which party, Democrats or Republicans, are more in league with the Israelis? Republicans are more in harmony with the Jewish leaders, Israelis, not Democrats. Third, and they say, Exhibit C, no son the law. Exhibit D, <laughs> President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to where? Jerusalem. And how did the Israelis respond and react to, to, to commend President Trump? They gave him a medal. They put his picture on one of their coins, temple coins. Pastor, a Republican um, White House would never enforce a Sunday law. You don't know history. When the first Sunday law was enforced, the people kept both days. You don't know your history. They kept both days, Sabbath and Sunday. Why? Because Sunday came in as a law of attraction to please both sides. Sabbath was kept, Sunday was kept. What all the devil, he called for meetings after meetings. And in those council meetings, the Sabbath was pressed down lower and lower. And Sunday was correspondingly uplifted higher and higher. Until Sabbath keepers outlawed, persecuted, prosecuted, and Sunday became preeminent in the world. That's how it's going to come. Why? Because history must be do you know your history, friends? Come here, watch. Pass this. Look at this. Come on. Pass that. Here it is. Ivanka Trump 
gives what now? Birth <laughs> to a beautiful Jewish baby. Orthodox Jewish daughter of Republican front runner Trump welcomes number three. Watch carefully. Mike Pence says what now? Last phrase. What is he upholding? America's Judeo Christian heritage. And many say, can't be in this under law, under a Republican controlled White House. Look at this, Trump. We are stopping cold the attacks on what? Judeo Christian values. Now, do Jews value Sabbath? Huh? So they say no Republican government will ever enforce a Sunday law. You are deceived. Headline, Israelis love Trump so much, more than almost any other nation. The polls show that. Israeli, May 2018, Israeli group mints Trump's face right here. Left coin, bottom, mints Trump's face on coin following U.S. Embassy move to Jerusalem. Do you see it now? Come to history now. GC, that's why the devil hates this book. He hates great controversy. The book, watch. Let's read. In the early part of the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church. All right. But while many God-fearing Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held, let's read, the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord and observed it in obedience to the fourth commandment. The arch deceiver had not completed his work. Do you see steps in the process? Let them keep both. And let's do it all in the name of religious liberty. Make sense now? Watch. The arch deceiver had not completed his work through half-converted pagans, that's one group, ambitious Catholics, number three, and word-loving churchmen. He accomplished his purpose. How did Satan become successful? Let's read. Vast councils were held from time to time in which the dignitaries of the church were convened from all the world. Hmm. In nearly every council, the what now? The Sabbath, which God had instituted, was pressed down a little lower, whilst the Sunday was correspondingly exalted. Churchmen did that. But the churchmen were influencing who? Statesmen. Watch now. Thus, the pagan festival came finally to be honored as a what? divine institution while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were declared to be accursed. Is that coming again, my friends? So don't expect when the Sunday law is enforced, firstly, it comes with teeth, no? You can still keep Sabbath. But as the calamities continue now, as the calamities get worse now, do you see it now? Then they say, we want Sunday to more be strictly kept. And those who are not keeping Sunday, they are causing the calamities. Ooh, the Jews will have to bow at that time. But true Seventh-day Adventists, true ones, would not bow, friends. Are we ready for it? I hope you got that, my friends. Now, do you remember this morning we played... This video here, I'm going back and then we're going to close. Watch this. This is a video that Marie puts to, uh, put together. Safe to serve, 
international team member. Watch this. They're some of the country's most powerful people, and now they have been gathering at the White House for Watch. God, making history as part of President, the President's Cabinet Bible study. So what's behind the spiritual awakening at the White House? Here to wait on us is Chief Political Correspondent for the Christian Broadcasting Network and host of Faith Nation, David Brody. Hey, David, good to see you. Hey, Zoe, good to see you. Thank you. Well, so tell us what's happening at the White House. They're having a Bible study every week. Every week at the HHS building, uh, cabinet members, 12 of them, which is the majority of the cabinet, is attending. These are evangelicals, Christians, uh, Mike Pompeo, the CIA, you've got Ben Carson, uh, Rick Perry, Tom Price. Ben Carson. The list goes on. And, you know, ben Carson. This is uh, planning to drop by. She is open for the president as well, so, uh, but he's getting the notes from the Bible study. So it's pretty fascinating. Our, our White House correspondent, Jennifer Wishon, broke the story. P pretty, pretty fascinating. Most, is this the most evangelical presidency you've seen? Oh, 100%. I don't think there's any More question so about it. More so than George Bush, 43? Yes, uh, and, if, uh, and I, uh, there are no qualms about that. Now, I know there might be some pushback for, from some evangelical leaders uh, in that George W. Bush era, but, but if you talk to evangelicals private, privately, the dirty little secret is they're getting more access uh, and FaceTime with this president uh, than George W. Bush, the evangelical president. There, there's not even a question about it. It's kind of like a kind of like a factory is in the sense that all of these folks just kind of keep coming in and out of it's like a shuttle mm -hmm. bus going into the white house from evangelicals and it's interesting because i actually emailed a evangelical leader the other day and i said hey there are a couple evangelical leaders at the white house today what's going on there you know try try to get it as a source and a guy says to me there's always evangelical leaders here every single day and that really is the case gc 445 now if we're going somewhere you better watch this watch carefully Well, I think what the American people have learned in the last 15 months is that people of faith all across this nation have a champion in President Donald Trump. Uh, a year ago, he said we were a nation of faith. And he took action last year to make sure that the federal government never imposed on the religious liberty of Americans, like in cases like the Little Sisters of the Poor. But this year, the president signed an executive order in the Rose Garden, David, that establishes a policy initiative within the White House that puts faith really at the center of policy development. You know, virtually every agency has a, right. a faith-based office that sees to the impact on communities of all types of faith in this country of, of various agency efforts. But this is really about making sure that as we develop policies for the country that we're always making room. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those uh, unalienable rights, the free exercise of religion that Americans cherish. Now, do you remember this morning, this was shown? Do you know where these people were? They were actually where? In the White House. Yes, the church in the White House. This is Ronnie Phillips, October 23rd. Where does he say he's at? Tagline right here on top. It's down here. We had, it's right there on top right here, down here. We had a what? A powerful time of worship and prayer. We're in the White House today. Vice President Pence and Pastor Bronson. I'll come back to this pastor right here. Look at the picture of Mike Pence. Now you see where they are, right? Look at this now. How many views did this video receive since October 23rd? The world is watching this. Two million views? Five days ago, friends. Two million views. How many comments? How many shares? The church is now at the White House. And we can't seem to wake up. And many say, Pastor, no son the law. Why? America stands for the Jews. No, Republicans stand for the Jews. Well, Constantine did too. That's it. Until Sunday was exalted and the Sabbath demoted. All right, now you'll see what's happening, friends.
no longer a song, a chant. And that's how demons occupy people's temples, temples through chants. Rep repetitive songs. It's a chant. And that's how spiritualism is going to play its role. Spiritualism, Romanism, and apostate Protestantism. Sunder Law, GC 588. We're here, friends. Did you learn anything today? Did we debunk the, fact, the theory about no Sunday law under a Republican government because Republicans are for the Jews? Constantine was also for Sabbath keepers too. The great. Look at this now. Now, I'll close right here. Where does the Sunday law pass first? I'm finished. Sunset. Where does the Sunday law pass first based on prophecy? Which country? Do you not know what's happening in the East? It's already set. So once America pulls that trigger, hit that domino, it's a domino effect around the world. Does anyone know what's happening in the land down under? Which, 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 which place is called the land down under? Australia. Land down under. Watch. Australia, look at this. October 19, 2018. Hmm. Shocking. Look at this. They have a, a leader who is prominent in Australia. Kevin Rudd. Don't focus on the extra stuff. Look at the red words. Plus, there is the matter that in Australia, in Australia, we have no constitutional separation of church and state. What does that mean, friends? They're ready, <laughs> They're ready my friends. In the land down under, there's no constitutional statute, policy, that says church and state must be So if they should not be separate, then they should be what? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Look at this now. Last sentence. Australia, the standouts are state funding for religious schools and the tax-free status of what? So what is funding private schools? It's the same thing Trump is bringing in America. We are taxpayers can now fund private schools. James Madison, Thomas Jefferson said, if you use taxpayer money to fund private schools, i.e. religious schools, that church and state uniting, Australia is already ripe for Sunday law, friends. Everything is set. Let's close. Go to Psalm 91 with me. No, friends. Oh, yes, let's go there. Where are we going to? Psalm 91. Look at this. Go home with this. Sun has set. Leave with this point here. Look with me at verse number 13. Ready for this, friends? Verse 13 says, Shall we all read? Thou, let's go, thou shalt tread upon the lion. Amen. And adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou do what? And what did we learn this morning? What is Christ waiting on? For us to trample Satan under our feet. Who is also called a lion in the Bible? The devil. First Peter 5, 7. Verse 8. Uh, be what? Vigilant. Why? For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring. Who is also called a serpent in scripture? Revelation 12. That old serpent. So can we tread upon him? Come with me. Verse 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I 
So even though it's coming, is there hope for us? Yes. yes. Come to verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him. In what time? So is this encouraging to take us tomorrow? The following. Next week, if we're alive, during the Sunday law crisis. He shall call upon me, and I, Jesus, will what? Deliver him. In what time? In time of trouble. But there's a condition. Go to verse 1. What is the condition? He that? Dwell where? Come on. Dwell where? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. Under what, friends? Shadow of the Almighty. And where is that secret place? Matthew 6. Where is that, where is that secret place? In the prayer closet, friends. So that means we need a stronger, consistent prayer life. What do you say? Amen. 